organic synthesis with alcohols. Now, we covered a whole chapter, the last chapter, on you know common patterns in organic synthesis and, and things of this sort, a whole chapter on synthesis, but it really focused on just really three sets of reactions, like you know substitution elimination, alkenes, alkynes, and I guess actually free radical halogenations were in there as well. So four different sets of reactions, So because that's all you learned up until then. So, But throughout this second semester, you're gonna be learning a whole bunch of reactions for new functional groups. And so when you approach synthesis at the end of that chapter, you you have to learn how to incorporate that new function group. But we're going to do that with alcohols in this chapter. And so you can't forget all of the reactions you've learned up until this point, but you should give special priority to the new ones because your professor is going to try and create synthesis questions that are most likely going to, pre, you know, prioritize the, the new stuff over the old stuff. And there's no way to get around not knowing the old stuff, but if you've got, you know, an option of producing something from a new reaction or an old reaction, odds are it's going to be from one of the new ones you learned in that chapter. So let's take a look. So first thing we want to do here is match up our carbon skeleton between your reactant and your product. And in this case, I've got a four carbon chain to start with, and I end up with a four carbon chain, but with one extra carbon. But this carbon right here is special. So normally when you get more carbons in your product than your reactant, you're thinking like, you know, acetylide ion reaction or Grignard reaction at this point, except if it involves a nitrile, a cyano group here. So, and you've got one way to do this, to pull this off, to add that cyano group, and that's through an SN2 reaction. So if we do this retro here, we're gonna work our way backwards. That means that right here, so if we're doing it through SN2, you must have had some leaving group right here with a wedged bond. That way you get the inversion of configuration. And in this case, we would add like sodium or potassium cyanide in a good aprotic solvent like acetone or DMSO or something like that. Okay, so now we've got generically leaving group here. So we have to figure, okay, we need to put a leaving group there and stuff like this. And we look at this and we're starting with an alcohol and an alcohol, the OH is not a good leaving group. So this is not an OH. So the question is, can I turn it into a leaving group with the exact same stereochemistry, no inversion of configuration? And so we got a couple options. We know how to turn this into, uh, we could use like HBr or something like that, but HBr goes through a carbocation intermediate with a secondary uh, alcohol and you'd get both R and S, not just the retained. And so your, your yield would be great. And so you're usually looking at something like PBR3, SOCl2. So, but PBR3 and SOCl2 lead to an inversion of configuration. So you could get a bromine or a chlorine here, but with a dashed bond. And so what we're gonna do here though, with retained configuration is form that sulfonate ester, that OTS group, if you will. And so in this case, we're gonna use tosyl chloride and pyridine. So, and tosyl chloride and pyridine turns this OH into a good leaving group, that's toluene sulfonate ester, abbreviated OTS. And so now we filled in the whole blank. So this, that's the whole synthesis here. It's just a two-step synthesis. Convert our hydrox group into a good leaving group with the same uh, configuration, and then SN2 inversion of configuration. All right, so let's look at the second one here. Second one here, we can look at our carbon skeleton again. We've got six carbons in the reactant, and now we've got seven carbons. And so in this case, we can see that, oh, we're going to have to make at least one carbon-carbon bond. So right there, at the very least. And if you're going to make a carbon-carbon bond, again, the most common ways that you've learned up till this point, and again, there's not a lot of these. So and you've learned two major ones. Now, obviously, SN2 with cyanide replacing a leaving group, that's a third, but it's a really minor one. doesn't show up very often. But the two major ways are either going to be with an acetylide ion, which you learned in the alkyne chapter, or with the Grignard reagent, which you learned in this chapter. And again, you should give special priority to what you learned in this chapter. It's not guaranteed that we're going to be using a Grignard reagent to pull this off, but more than likely, it's probably going to use a Grignard rather than the acetylide. And so usually I would try the Grignard first. And if that doesn't work, well, then I'd revert back to the acetylide, something that's old. So in this case, somewhere along the way, we're probably going to do something with a Grignard. Now, retro is going to be a little bit challenging here because we need to make an alkene. And we've got multitude of ways to make alkenes. Well, alkenes are made from elimination reactions or reduction of alkynes. So, but elimination reactions most likely. And uh, in this case, you got to have a good leaving group to do a normal like E2 elimination or we learned how to do elimination of alcohols in this chapter as well. And so if we were gonna do an elimination of an alcohol as the most likely candidate, because again, that's new, something we're being tested on this chapter, most likely you had an alcohol right here. So, and with concentrated H2SO4,
it would turn that alcohol into the uh, Zaitsev elimination product, exactly what we're looking for. So chose the alcohol here. And again, now we've got to look and say, okay, well, what are we going to make here? Well, just so happens that your Grignard reaction, which we said we're probably going to be doing somewhere along the way. So to make this carbon carbon bond, but Grignard reactions produce alcohols when they re react with the corresponding uh, ketone or aldehyde. And so in this case, it's once again, this is the bond we're trying to make. The side of that bond, the carbon on that side that's bonded to oxygen, used to be bonded to a double, you know, used to have a double bond to oxygen, be a ketone in this case to make a tertiary alcohol. And so this could be made from a ketone. And then the other side of, of the carbon carbon bond that you're making, the side that doesn't have the oxygen on it, that's the Grignard side. In this case, it's just a methyl group. And so we would have just used like CH3. MGBR followed by your acid workup step. And that would have, so we'd have nucleophilic attack right here, kick the electrons out, protonate it to give you this lovely tertiary alcohol. So, so far so good. So, and then to make a ketone, start looking and we've got a secondary alcohol to the corresponding ketone. And you guys have learned how to do that oxidation of alcohols. And for a secondary alcohol, you learn that either chromic acid or PCC both will oxidize it here. It's, it's a whole lot easier to write PCC than chromic acid, that's what I'm gonna do. But had you write, you know, sodium dichromate and sulfuric acid, that would have worked as well. All right, let's try a couple more here. And the next one here, we've got a seven carbon structure and our product also has seven carbons. So probably not gonna be involved in making a carbon carbon bond in anywhere here. So no Grignard required or anything of that sort. So, uh, but we gotta make a carboxylic acid and so, You've got a couple different ways you might potentially try to make a carboxylic acid. And one of them you learned, and it's an old reaction, and that would be like if you had an alkyne here of any sort and you did ozonolysis of that alkyne, you could form, you know, like if it was terminal CO2 on one side, but the carboxylic acid on the other side, that would be one way to pull it off. And that's old, but you learned a new way to pull it off. And again, give priority or precedence to the new way because your, your professor is more than likely trying to test you more on the new stuff than the old stuff. And in this case, you can oxidize a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid. And you might recall that it's with a primary alcohol that it matters which oxidizing agent you use. So a PCC would only oxidize a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. So if you want to go all the way to the carboxylic acid, you've got to use chromic acid. Which can be represented one of three ways, and that's one of them. Sodium dichromate and H2SO4. Cool, so that's one way to pull it off. And again, there's still a way to pull this off as well. So, but I can look back here and be like, oh, this would be very difficult to make. I would take a lot of steps. So, and it's old, whereas here, that doesn't look so bad. And so question is then, how do we make this primary alcohol? Well, again, you've got a couple of different ways to make that primary alcohol. And one of them would be, well, what if you just had a leaving group right there? and you just try to do SN2 with like hydroxide or something like that. So, and that's great, but getting a bromine there is no easy feat as well, as we'll see. It's not the most substituted carbon in there, like there, so we could do it like free radical halogenation. It's not gonna be possible here. The other option you've had for making an alcohol at exactly that position is if you had an alkene right here. So and with that alkene, you could do anti-Markovnikov addition of H and OH. So, and that's pulled off with hydroboration oxidation BH3, THF, followed by peroxide and sodium hydroxide. And that would pull that off. Now, the truth is you could make this love, you know, get the bromine right here, make this lovely species right here. If you also made this alkene and did HBr with peroxide, ROR, right? So, but that would just, you know, I, you know, it would take me two steps to get here instead of just one step to get here from the alkene. So this is gonna be the superior way anyways. All right, so question is then, how do we make an alkene? Well, you can make an alkene. So, and you guys have learned that from an alkyl halide with elimination or with an alcohol in elimination. So problem for you guys are though, is that to do this with an alcohol, so you've learned that concentrated H2SO4 goes Markovnikov every time. And so in our case, that alcohol would have to actually be out on this carbon. So, and then you learn that that's actually undergoes a, a special funky case anyways, and the alkene wouldn't end up here anyways. So, and if your alk your alcohol 
was right here. It would prefer the Zaitsev product and form either here or here. Now, I didn't cover it, and, and many classes don't, but it turns out POCL3 can be used, if you've learned that in your class. So, no, I'm not going to use it because I don't normally incorporate it into my curriculum and stuff. So, But you could use POCL3 here and actually form the Hoffman alkene, which would work here. So, But again, not in a lot of textbooks. A lot of professors leave it out of the curriculum. So I'm not going to use it here as well. So the question is then, how do I make this lovely alkene? Well, I can make this alkene if I had a good leaving group in one of these two positions, like a halide. So, and I can see here that it's much easier to get a good leaving group in that position than in that one. In fact, that was one of the problems. <laughs> so I might have to have a good leaving group there and you get this kind of circular argument going on. So, but if I had a good leaving group right there, and I wanted to make this lovely alkene, the Hoffman alkene, that's where we'd use a bulky base like potassium terp-butoxide. So, and again, the reason I chose putting the bromine here instead of here is the ease with which I can get it there on the most substituted carbon. So that most substituted carbon is one hydrogen and to replace it there, that's exactly where free radical halogenation would replace it like Br2 and light and technically NBS and light would do the same thing. And there's your synthesis. And in this case, it's one, two, three, four steps. And we're really pushing the boundaries of what you can be expected to do because four steps is actually a rather long synthesis problem at this stage. So most commonly, you're probably gonna see three steps, uh, FYI. So this is getting, a, like I said, pushing it just a little bit. All right, we'll finish this off with one more here. And uh, again, first thing you wanna do is match up your carbon chains. And here I've got a five carbon chain. Here I've got a six carbon chain. And so again, we're gonna to need to make a carbon-carbon bond somewhere. And with these five carbons compared to these six, either we're gonna attach the end carbon on this side or we're gonna attach the end carbon on the right side. Now, in this case, I've got the functionality here on the right side with an alkene functional group here and a ketone functional group on the right side here. So odds are, so easiest to do reactions where you have functional groups. So odds are we're probably making that bond there somewhere along the way. And to make a carbon-carbon bond, again, you know two major ways to pull this off right now with uh, acetylide ions or with a Grignard reaction. So, and again, you should give precedence to the Grignard because that's new from this chapter. So, but technically, uh, if I wanted to make now this ketone, you got a couple different ways you've learned to make ketones, and one of them could be from an alkyne. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And you guys learned like HgSO4, H2SO4. So back in the alkyne chapter, you learned that you can add H and OH Markovnikov, and then it tautomerizes to this ketone. So that's one way to pull this off. So, but you've learned another way to make a ketone in this chapter. And in this chapter, you learned that you can oxidize a secondary alcohol to a ketone. And again, with a secondary alcohol, it doesn't matter which of your oxidizing agents you use, either PCC or chromic acid. And once again, it is much easier to write PCC. Okay, so I'm giving precedence to the, the method using the alcohol. It doesn't rule this out completely. So it just, like I said, it's much more likely just, again, your, your professor's trying to test you on what's new more than they're trying to test you on what's old. All right. So the question then becomes is, can I make this alcohol? And what's nice again, we said we're probably gonna have to use either an acetylide reaction or a Grignard reaction somewhere along the way. And again, the Grignard's more likely, being that it's new in this chapter, and Grignard's produce alcohols. And so I've got the extra carbon that I need right where the alcohol is present. That's a great time to do your Grignard. And so in this case, we're gonna try and make this carbon-carbon bond right here. The, the side of that bond that has the uh, alcohol is where you used to have a double bond to oxygen. And so in this case, we used to have our double bond to oxygen right there, which was an aldehyde. And in this case, we just, the other side of the carbon-carbon bond is your Grignard reagent. In this case, just a methyl group. So we should use a methyl Grignard, which I'll use CH3MGBR, again, followed by your acid workup step. And so the question is, okay, well, how do we make this five carbon aldehyde? Well, again, you've got two ways to make an aldehyde. So one of them could be involving an alkyne or one of them could be oxidizing an alcohol, which again, will give precedence to. And I'm running out of room, so I'll kind of work my way down here. And in this case, it would be a primary alcohol and to oxidize a primary alcohol to an aldehyde, that's when you have to use PCC instead of chromic acid. Chromic acid would have oxidized the primary alcohol all the way to a carboxylic acid. 
And the question is then, well, how do we make this alcohol? Well, I can totally make that alcohol from this alkene. And in this case, it's the addition of H and OH, anti-Markovnikov, which is what we accomplish again with hydroboration oxidation. BH3THF followed by peroxide in a basic environment. Cool. And this is again a, a longer synthesis. We got one step, two steps, three steps, four steps to get there. Now notice a couple places like, you know, trying to go, go this route and stuff like this. Could I pull this off? This would be a very difficult synthesis because in this case, I know how to make this carbon-carbon bond. So, but notice that would leave me with a four carbon fragment on this side, two carbons on this side, and I'm starting with a five carbon fragment, that would have been a pain in the butt. Now, the more reactions you put under your belt as this semester progresses, the more likely you're gonna end up with uh, synthesis problems that have more than one viable method for coming about that. And professors usually give you full credit if you come up with one of those other ways, provided it doesn't have a significantly greater number of steps. Now right here, this is a four-step synthesis. If you would have been able to come up with a, an alternative four-step synthesis or maybe even five steps, good chance your professor gives you full credit. But if you come up with another way to pull this off that's like eight steps, you're probably gonna lose a few points in your typical OCHEM class. So uh, economy also matters, and this matters in the lab, right? So the whole reason they're, they're grading you on this is because uh, every step you do often involves a purification, and every time you do a purification and every time you do a reaction, you're gonna lower your yield. Not all reactions go to completion, and then when you purify, you always lose some of your product. So uh, the fewer steps you can do your synthesis, the better yields you get. So it's not just that your professor is being picky. There's a practical application to this as well. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the most helpful things you can do to help promote the channel. And if you're looking for the study guide, if you're looking for practice problems, practice final exam reviews, practice final exams, uh, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.